Hey everyone, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government ad series. This is episode 10 of the podcast, and it's a companion to our Honest Government ad about the coronavirus. Hello, I'm from the government with an urgent message about the coronavirus. We know many of you are confused. Some say it's no big deal. Italians are freaking out. The Chinese are hiding out. And Aussies seem to think the virus attacks your butthole. I want to jump straight into this because the content of this podcast is really vitally important and needs to be spread and understood by people as soon as possible to avoid a shit show. We've seen the headlines coming out of Italy and it's like a nightmare, I shit you not. And the people there are saying if they could go back in time, they would act sooner to stop the spread of the coronavirus. If I'm sounding a little bit alarmist, it's because it really is an alarming situation. Governments are not doing a good enough job in communicating the danger and the urgency of the situation that we're in. Many people have said that our video was the most effective communication campaign about the importance of flattening the curve, which when you think about it, it's fucking terrifying. This was supposed to be satire of government publicity campaigns, not a substitute for them. Thankfully, it's not just been us raising the alarm. There have been some excellent communicators raising awareness, and one of them is Dr. Norman Swan, who I am honored to have as our guest today on the Juice Media Podcast. For those of you who don't already know, Dr. Swan and Tegan Taylor have been producing the Corona Cast, a daily podcast on ABC, which has been providing short, pithy daily updates on coronavirus, answering public questions, and basically keeping the nation informed as the ABC does best. As always here on the Juice Media Podcast, we have a policy of giving the microphone to experts, and Dr. Norman Swan is the kind of expert that we really need because yes, he's a doctor, he's a physician, and he's also a broadcaster, so very good communicator on these issues. And if there's one thing that we need right now, it's clear, accurate expert communication so that people know what is happening and what needs to be done. So without further ado, we're going to get straight into the podcast and a reminder that from now on, we are uploading our podcasts here to YouTube to make it easier for you to see them and share them. But we'll still keep uploading the podcast to our podcast host, so you'll still find it there on your podcast app. And now I'd like to welcome onto the Juice Media Podcast, Dr. Norman Swan. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Norman. Can you please give us an update? The situation is changing very fast. Where are things at right now with COVID-19 in Australia? Can you give us a situation report? Well, as we speak on the day that we speak, which is Saturday the 21st of March, there are about 800 cases known, which probably means there are 8,000 cases in reality, maybe even more than that, because there are always more than um, than are reported. We are not doing the intensive testing that they're doing in some other parts of the world. So we really don't know about asymptomatic cases or people who are mildly ill and so on, but 800. And that's um, where Italy was on the 7th of March. So we are talking on the 21st of March. So that's maybe 15 days, you know, 14 or 15 days ago was where Italy was. And the, what counts is, this, is the height, is, the, is how steep the curve is upwards. And our curve is going, you know, not quite vertical, but almost vertical, vertically, I should say. And the uh, doubling time, in other words, the number of days it takes to double the number of cases is shortening in Australia. So it was four or five, three, now getting on to be two, according to some analysts. So that means that we're going rapid, we're rapidly rising. And that means that whatever we did two weeks ago didn't work then. Because remember, this is delayed action. The 800 cases we see today, and wherever you might be listening to this podcast, the number of cases you see today wherever you live is what happened five to 14 days ago, maybe, maybe even longer ago than that. It might have been a virus that was going in the community under the radar with mild symptoms nobody noticed, and it went through two cycles before it started to emerge in the population. So it could even be a month ago. But that also means that what's happening today won't be seen in the community for another five to 14 days on average, maybe even longer. So it's it, 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 you press a button now, you don't see the effect for 14 days. That's why there's not a moment to, to be lost. Okay, so basically, it's not a good situation we're in. It's not the time to be complacent. Can you give us a sense? You say there's no time to lose. How much time do we have? So we, we are we are where Italy was. Yeah. So we're you could argue that we're a couple of weeks behind Italy. Right. And well, we're not Italy. We're you know we're different and we're low numbers and so on. Yeah. But if you said to an Italian in Lombardy, in Milan or elsewhere in northern Italy two weeks ago when there were 700 cases, if you knew then what you know now 
would you be saying, you know, 100 people indoors, 500 outdoors or four meter radius? And they would say, my God, no, yeah. you know, you got to shut that now before it goes nuts. With that in mind, my hometown of Florence, I just shared on our social media footage is incredible. It's haunting. Florence is usually bustling with tourists. Someone did a drone uh, video almost completely deserted. Uh, my dad is in Florence at the moment. Meanwhile, in Bondi Beach, people are out and about as if nothing were. We saw footage yesterday of Bondi, which just makes my hair raise. Now, I don't want to have a crack at people for going to Bondi or getting off a cruise ship, but I'm wondering whether the government deserves to be blamed for not communicating the dangers of these kinds of mass gatherings that we're seeing still today in Australia. Is the Australian government taking COVID-19 seriously enough, in your opinion? They're taking it seriously. But I think that they're they're treading too lightly, and they must be looking at the same graphs I am. These graphs are going straight up, and there's no magic fairy here with strong muscles who's going to get to the top of the curve and pull it down by some waving of a Harry Potter wand. That is not going to happen. This is not going to come down of its own accord. You can predict with confidence. This is year seven maths. Any any primary school student can do the maths on this, that if it doubles every two or three days, where we will be in a week, where we'll be in two weeks, and there's nothing to indicate that that's bending at all. So you can predict with confidence where it's going, and you could have predicted with confidence probably a week ago where it was going. And they are just lightly tapping the pedal now and again, I'm not saying they're not worried about it. They are worried about it. They're taking it seriously, but they are not acting decisively. Okay, well, that's at least partly reassuring. Um, perhaps slightly awkward question, but if you were the chief medical officer, what do you feel the advice should be right now? Well, I'm not getting into that game because people are you know, yes. <laughs> playing me off against the chief medical sure. officer. So I'm very gl glad. I am very glad that all I am is a broadcast journalist with a medical degree watching from the side. You know, I, I, I do not envy any of the chief medical officers around Australia or in any other country. Bloody hard job, really difficult decisions. But it is being complicated by the fact that there are, the politicians are too involved in this. And so you have political decisions being made. Whereas when HIV came along, the politicians were smart enough, at least in countries like Australia, to take it out of their hands. Why would you wake up every morning if you're the Minister for Health feeling responsible for this? Put it in the hands of people who are really expert, transparent, communicating with the public all the time and making the tough decisions for you. And they have to be tough decisions. 30% of new infections in most parts of the world, when it's taking off like it is now, um, are spread by young people. They have milder disease. They don't recognize they've got it. They're only half as infectious as people with severe disease, but there's still a lot of them. So 30% of new infections come from young people. And that's how it spreads in the community. And young people think, well, I'm still belted against this. I'm not going to get really sick. 38%, I think it is 38% in New York State of people in intensive care beds are actually young people um, and they die. They don't die at the same rate as really, as really older people, but they do die. And th so this is not an exclusive problem of people in aged care homes. This affects the whole community and in particular also in young babies too. So we've got to protect. And the other reason we're doing this is to protect doctors and nurses. They're the ones who are dealing with this at the front end. And if we're irresponsible about it, I mean, the predictions are if we do nothing more now in Australia, by April 7th, our intensive care units will be overwhelmed. That's the prediction from the modelling. I was just going to ask you that when you said it's very predictable where this is going to go. Um, so April 7th, I, I want to repeat that. I think it's really important for people to understand that our healthcare services are going to be overwhelmed. That means you don't have to get sick with coronavirus to be in trouble. You could be ill and need hospital treatment of any kind, and you might not be able to get that treatment. No question. That's what's happening. It's happening very, very quickly in the United States, in, in the in the coastal states in the United States. It's happening in Italy. It happened in China, and um, this is this is serious stuff. One of the things that's been causing a lot of confusion and even distress is the question about whether whether or not to close schools. We've seen this happen in many other countries, but until now, our government has decided to keep schools open. The government keeps sort of repeating the angle that because children are relatively immune to COVID-19, it's not a big deal. 
which has been very infuriating because obviously many teachers are 60 and over, but also people aren't worried necessarily about the children. They're worried about children then infecting grandparents, teachers, healthcare workers. Um, there was an article yesterday in The Guardian, teachers saying we feel expendable. Um, what, what is your take on this? There's been a bit of confusion. Um, has your message been consistent around us? And what is your, your take on the school's situation? There are two aspects to the school situation. So through my on my our Corona cast that I do with Tegan Taylor uh, podcast, um, we get a lot of questions and we get about a thousand questions a day, about 5,000 last weekend. So a lot of questions coming in and they're changing as time goes on. So it's less about how do you wash your hands now? And the questions now are from parents saying, should I keep my child home from school? Which a lot of parents are doing anyway. Now, my answer to that is you are not necessarily going to save your child from an infection by keeping them home from school at this stage in the epidemic. So that that's so th you've got to get the school's decision in, into context. The reason you would shut down schools is not to protect individual children, but to protect the community at large, because large gatherings of young people are sources of infection for the rest of the community. So, but it doesn't make sense at the moment to keep your child home from school because the risk to an individual child is low. But um, in my view, we're getting to the point where for the rest of the community, albeit it will be a very difficult decision to make. I understand that. I understand that it's not cost free. Some people will have to stay home from work if they're indeed going to work to look after their kids. This is not, you know, kids are going to go stir crazy at home. It's a tough decision, but you do it for the public good. But there's no sense in before that decision is made, holding your child back from school, you might as well let them go. But you do have to keep them away from your 70 and 80 year old parents and grandparents, um, because kids could be a source of infection and you don't know it. And so people who are older with more other diseases do need to be relatively isolated at the moment, even at this stage in the epidemic, because while there are this number of cases, there are far more people infected in the community than we know about. And we've just got to get things organized now. So if I've understood correctly, yes, the right thing would be to shut everything down, close schools. But until that directive comes from the government and everyone's doing it, there's, there's no point. There's no point. So you're saying there's no point. To your child home. So just to clarify, because I think there's been some confusion. Your message has been consistent. Yes, we should close the schools, but it shouldn't be an individual decision. It should be a collective government directed uh, policy, basically. Yeah, government, government's got to make that yeah. decision. And I understand why they haven't. It's a really tough decision. So I do understand that thing that problem and i think they were hoping that the curve would bend the curve hasn't bent it hasn't bent now for several days and there's only we don't this is a time frame of days not mm. weeks and it's not bending and we're at 800 cases we've got 14 days before we turn into italy now's the time to actually do everything we can to get that curve flattened keep it down and then work out after that when you might lift your foot off the brake just to see whether it's under control. Yeah. But now's the time to do that, not when we've got several thousand cases and we've got doctors and nurses picking up this infection and ending up in ICU. I just want to turn from this really disturbing, frightening uh, things that we're talking about to some po a positive angle potentially and solutions that are on the horizon. There's been some talk of what can we do if we take society level action? For example, can we have makeshift hospitals that can be quickly set up? Can we have faster testing? I heard South Korea has gone from a 50, uh, has a 15 minute test now. Is there an antibody test on the horizon so that at least we know people who have immunity and they can be placed you know, um, on the front line? The chloroquine treatment, not a cure, but a treatment that's been talked about. Are any of these things um, giving you cause for hope? Um, well, let's separate them out. I think te test technology will change. We have to test more in Australia. I'm, I, I, some experts would agree with me, some experts wouldn't. But if you look overseas where they've actually had more success in controlling it, they just test much more than we do. And they contact trace much more aggressively than we do because they're willing to infringe on human rights, you know, personal rights and, uh, and so on. So it's, again, not straightforward. But, you know, it plays, some places have closed schools, some places haven't. Singapore hasn't, and Singapore is now seeing its number of cases rising quite rapidly. Testing could get faster. Yeah, everybody's looking for a reliable blood test so that you can actually check whether you've had an infection in the past. Well, it doesn't tell you whether, you've got, whether you're infectious, but it tells you 
whether you've actually got one now or you've had one in the past, you had an infection in the past. So you can find the immune population as well. So, and that gives you a much more accurate sense of things. So blood tests will be on its way. I'm not sure when. There are lots of things being said on the internet about various treatments and what's worked and what hasn't worked in China. The evidence is poor. The evidence is poor for chloroquine, the anti-malarial. Um, it's not guaranteed that that works. I've got a story on it on Monday night's health report. You just got to do proper randomized trials. This was exactly what happened during the early days of HIV AIDS. New treatments were coming out all over the place without being properly tested. And then when the dust settled out of all these hundreds of things, which some of which sounded sensible, some of which sounded mad, only one treatment emerged at that point, which was AZT. Um, and that's likely what's going to happen here is that there'll be just lots of noise and smoke and mirrors and um, lousy studies that people extrapolate that haven't been properly controlled. And, you know, some of these drugs are not harmless. They've got side effects and some of them cost a lot of money, not chloroquine. You just got to be really careful and just wait until the evidence comes out. So um, obviously th there are some things on the horizon, but um, obviously the playing playing for time game is is dangerous. So returning a little bit to the you know the strategy that you're advocating, which is a total lockdown. I mean, do you feel that that is inevitable? For Australia? Uh, I'm not sorry. I'm not, not not a total lockdown the way they've done in the New York State. I don't think we need that at the moment. But I think that it's it's about people not mixing with other people um, unless they have to. You know, you can be allowed to go to the shops, but essentially you're at home most of the time. Um, you try and exercise at home, you don't mix with your neighbors. And it's not a total lockdown yeah. where people, you know, like in China where people got to deliver food, but much more aggressive and assertive than it is now. People don't realize what's going on here. I mean, what's going on is a major change to the way we live that we haven't seen for a century. And it's because we've got no treatment and no vaccine. And so it's isol a quarantine, isolation if you've got the infection. That's the way we control it. And, and spatial distancing is the main thing. To do it properly is major. Okay, thanks for thanks for clarifying that point. So um, that's actually encouraging in the sense that it, we're not looking at such severe restrictions as we're seeing in other places yet. And potentially... Um, at well, we're, 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 yeah, we're, we're not welding the doors to your apartment. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so you can't get out. But we, but for example, if you in in some parts of the world where you've been quite successful, they make sure you put on your location um, identifier on your phone. And if you're on quarantine and you move out of your house, you'll get pinged. Right. You know, and they're using CCTV cameras to pick up contacts. Yeah. There's all sorts of things that are happening that we probably would have balked at six weeks ago. But maybe we won't balk at it now, just protect the common good. And I think that takes us into, um, I, I want to kind of shift into the the bigger picture. I always like to try and end these, all these podcasts on a bigger picture. You mentioned in one of your podcasts that um, this will be remembered as the year of the plague. We will never forget this year. It is going to be, it is going to leave a permanent mark on our um, collective conscious and change the way that we live, essentially. Can you reflect a little bit more on that? Um, perhaps, uh, you know, feel free to get philosophical if you want, but in terms of how will this change the cultural mood of Australia, potentially even our society? Well, I think that we'll find, I think some wonderful things will happen and they already are. Um, so choirs rehearsing on Zoom, for example. We had drinks here, afternoon drinks here at the ABC um, on Zoom, with everybody in the unit coming in on Zoom and talking to each other. So it's spatial distancing, not social distancing. So we'll, we'll find ways of socially coming together, perhaps even more closely, and we'll think about social contacts and social support in a much more sophisticated and nuanced way than we have in the past. We'll find new ways of doing that. And I think that we'll value each other and our friends and our families more after this than we did before. And those are wonderful things that will happen. Hopefully, the uh, government loosens up on innovation and releases some funds, and you might get some entrepreneurs in Australia and other places developing new businesses, new ways of communicating, new apps, new ways of controlling the epidemic, minimizing the effect on lifestyle, maybe even new pharmaceutical industries and so on. So you'll see a blossoming of things. Maybe we'll see some breakdown of barriers to better health care that, that we haven't seen in the past. All those are good things that will happen as a result of this. I think it's going to be a growing experience for us all, but it's going to be tough too. 
I mean, very tough. You know, nice weather outside and you, you, you really can't go out or you shouldn't go out and mix with other people. If you're a grandparent, you're not going to be seeing your grandchildren directly. It's as if you're living overseas and you're going to be doing FaceTime with your grandchildren as if they're living in London, um, but they're just around the corner. Those sorts of things. And that's going to be so upsetting and so difficult for many grandparents. And for young people, there's an even greater sense of responsibility on young people because I think they all just go off. And some, some will go off and have COVID-19 parties where they infect each other because they want to just get it over with, not realizing that the effect of that will be to spread to their parents and grandparents. And maybe people that they went to school with who are now doctors and nurses who are actually going to have to deal with this and get infected and maybe end up in an intensive care bed um, simply because you wanted to get it over with and mix it, but you're spreading it through the community. We've all got to play our role here and it is going to be tough. I think the other thing that uh, I, I completely agree with that. And I think the other thing that we also are realizing very quickly is how dependent we are on each other. And specifically, we're recognizing that nurses and teachers are essential workers, you know, and we, 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 we kind of like uh, told that, you know, it's the big bankers and financiers that hold the whole society together and the whole idea that wealth trickles down. But once you take away these essential parts of society, everything comes to a standstill. Um, and I, hopefully, you know, next time there's another pay negotiation for nurses and teachers, that this will be treated differently. And also, I think important to remember how essential the ABC is. Your podcast has played such a vital role. And yet only a year ago, we were talking about, the government was talking about cutting funding to the ABC. So well, they, they weren't talking about it. They did cut funding. Right. Um, so you, hopefully this will not be allowed to happen again. We now know, we can see how essential so, these services yeah. are. So the point I'd make here, is people are, people people are kind of overblowing what I've done. Um, they're just overblowing it, and, and I know I feel I've accidentally filled a vacuum. It's been kind of an accidental thing, but filled a vacuum. But what's not accidental about this is there would be no me were it not for the ABC. So it, the commercial television stations would never have developed somebody like me, who was you know a trainee pediatrician, joined the media. I've been in the ABC ever since, and I've developed skills and knowledge about how to communicate and combine my medical training with communication. So now I'm not a doctor anymore. I'm a, I've got a doctor in front of my name. I'm medically qualified, but I'm a broadcast journalist. I'm able to synthesize those two. And, and people confuse that. You know, they say, well, if you look at David Attenborough, um, he's a naturalist. Well, David Attenborough is not a naturalist, never has been. He's a, he's a broadcaster, as, and his entire career has been in broadcasting. People just identify him in that way. And it's the BBC that's nurtured David Attenborough. Commercial television in Britain would not have done that, and commercial television and radio would not have done, you know, developed somebody like me over a period of decades and invested in specialists. The, the, thing, the reason I can do what I do, and it would be anybody who was recruited to the ABC into the role I've got, would have been able to do what I do. And it's only because the ABC exists. So if we want uh, bushfire emergencies, you know, reliable, trustworthy sources, you want trustworthy sources of information, only the ABC in Australia will develop that and nurture that for you because the market doesn't provide for it. I'm not blaming commercial television, but they're on a commercial imperative. And if I worked on commercial television, they'd have me selling margarine, your know, health, your know, cholesterol lowering margarine, because that's how they make their money. And you wouldn't have the freedom to do what you need to do in broadcast journalism. So this is why you've got the ABC to be able to nurture skills that are reflected in what I do, but they're not unique in me is what I'm saying, but they are unique to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. So remember that people, next time the government talks about cutting funding, hands off the ABC needs to be really firm in our minds because we need more Norman Swans and bushfire information services. Because if one thing's clear from all this and the bushfires, it's that we can't rely on our government to play that role. I just want to ask you one final question and then I'm going to let you go because you have a nation to help keep informed. The climate emergency. Here at the Juice Media, really, it's the story, it's the narrative for us that really glues everything together. All roads lead back to the climate emergency, and so does this one. And I was hoping to end by reflecting a little bit on the parallels between this crisis that we're seeing with COVID-19 and the broader crisis that we face with the climate emergency. 
The parallels in how we respond to these two crises is very revealing and in some ways very similar. The response to COVID-19 is like a fast forward, high speed version of our response to the climate emergency. The first similarity is that it's a threat we've been warned about for ages, but we haven't prepared for. In both cases, scientists and experts are not heard. The second is that when the symptoms finally manifest themselves, our leaders respond with dumb fuckery. And nowhere has this been clearer than the US where there's been massive denial and dismissal, which has wasted precious time. And the third parallel is that once our governments finally admit that there is a serious problem, by then it's too late to craft gradual, incremental, and manageable changes and the measures that we have to take have to be vastly more difficult, costly and hurtful to our society than they would have been if we had acted earlier. The solutions are also very similar. The things that what needs to be done to solve the COVID crisis is the world coming together. If, if everyone on the planet could theoretically self-isolate for three to six weeks, COVID-19 would be gone from the planet. But that requires a level of coordination, global coordination, which just seems impossible. Which brings me to my very vague, rambly, open-ended question about can the COVID-19 situation be a teachable moment for humanity so that we can learn to come together as a species so that we can really tackle some of the greatest problems that we face, such as the climate emergency? The way I think about this is that in Australia, if you go back a year, you had climate change scientists and bushfire experts saying to the government and others, there's going to be a bad bushfire season in late 2000, in the summer in the, in the Australian summer of 2019, 2020. They predicted it with confidence. They then tried to convince people of it. They wouldn't be convinced of it. They didn't take action. And it happened. And um, I find myself very similar situation to them. If you'd asked any of them, they would have said, please let me be wrong. And I say that too. I, you know, the best, the worst thing that can happen to me is that in six weeks' time, the shock jocks who've been saying this is not a problem say, "What an idiot that guy at the ABC was, Norman Swan. You know, he predicted this. He's a Jeremiah, and nothing's happened." That would be the best result of all because it would mean that the prevention has worked. Because when prevention works, you don't see a crisis, and, the, and so it's the absence of a crisis. And so it is like climate change where. We've seen that in the last 12 months. You don't have to project forward with climate change. You just go back a year, confidently predicted from the mathematical models that we were going to have a bad bushfire season. Sure enough, it happened. And where we're sitting now, it's not magic. It's sitting there. It's year seven maths. It's just going to keep on going. And, um, and you just set that as an exercise for a primary school child in maths and they'll work it out for you and in two weeks time how many cases there'll be in Australia unless that curve gets bent down and we know what to do and we're not doing enough of it yet. Thank you for leaving us with that. I'm not going to take up more of your time because I know you have a lot to do. Thank you so much for coming on the Juice Media podcast, uh, Dr. Norman Swan. Thanks for having me. For those of you who are not aware of the Corona Cast, which is a podcast that Dr. Norman Swan and Tegan Taylor do, providing a daily update on the situation with the coronavirus in Australia, and not just Australia, most of the information is relevant to everyone. I'm going to put the link to that podcast in the show notes. Please check it out. Please tune in daily uh, to keep informed and stay up to date. I'm going to wrap this up now just so we can get this podcast out as soon as possible because the information is really time sensitive. You've been listening to Giordano on the Juice Media podcast. If you appreciated the podcast, if you enjoy what we do, please spread the word, share the podcast with your friends and families and pets so that more people know about it. Spread the podcast, not the virus. I'll catch you soon for our next Honest Government ad, which will be out soon. Until then, please take care. And if you're like us and in self-isolation indoors, thank you for doing your part to flatten the curve and protect our health carers and hospitals, our elderly and the most vulnerable in our society. Take care, good luck, and please keep in touch. Remember, physical spatial distancing, not social distancing. We can get through this.